With news of a sequel, I decided to go ahead and make this video. The 2019 Lion King remake have gotten some pretty mixed reviews. Not really. Pretty much everyone has said the same thing. Beautiful graphics, amazing CGI for an emotionless, lifeless retelling of a movie that is timeless and still holds up to this day. Out of all the reviews that I watched on the internet because the ones on the TV are paid for, most of them were pretty much complaints. But none of them tried to suggest how it could have been fixed. And I understand that it's already out there in the universe, but there are plenty of videos out there that people have voiced their opinions on on how it could have been better. So what I'm going to try to do with this video, I'm going to try to fix the 2019 Lion King remake. I know that all of the other reviews for this movie have already talked about the CGI, but I just want to touch on it for just a moment. John Favreau's vision for the remake was to film it as if it was a documentary. I'm going to guess that anyone watching has watched a documentary here or there, and maybe you've noticed that some of the coloring, specifically the scenery, has been edited to stand out more to capture the audience's attention to get them interested into watching and eventually make them aware that the animal's population numbers and environment are rapidly declining and need support in order to protect them. I mean, my god, look at this. This is actually from a documentary, but do you see any of this in the Lion King remake. As for the animals, easing up on the realism wouldn't have hurt any. And as for the voice acting, everyone had complaints. It wasn't just one actor's fault. Personally, I thought everyone was lacking, except maybe Timon and Pumbaa. But their actors were given creative freedom, because I don't think the producers cared too much since they were side characters. I like Shinzi's voice actress, Florence. I think she did a good job with what little she was given. The wheels were starting to turn at this point, and I noticed something else in both films. In the song, Be Prepared That Scar Sings, the lyrics, Meticulous Planning, immediately stood out to me, and the light bulb went off. Let's go behind the curtain and show Scar planning his treachery. I understand that for the original movie, they did not show this part because they didn't want to lose the younger audience's attention and to build up suspense when it came to the actual death scene. But for the remake, they could have incorporated something there, which made me think of, bear with me, light Yagami from Death Note. Stay with me. The whole point of Death Note, spoilers for anyone who hasn't watched or read the manga, both protagonists are trying to discover the name of each other by trying to outwit each other. Light wants L's name to kill him and L wants to identify Kira, arrest him, and ultimately execute him. I know it sounds boring the way I tell it, but it's insanely good. While trying to incorporate elements from the Death Note into the Lion King, I notice that Scar and Light have a lot in common. Both think very highly of themselves themselves and very little of the ones around them. They're both manipulative, abusive, and even when their backs are against the wall, they still manage to maintain some level of control. I know there's people watching this and think I'm crazy, but I stand by my decision. However, there's a problem. In Death Note, Light manipulates all sorts of people to do what he wants. But in Lion King, there's not really anyone for Scar to manipulate to do his bidding besides the hyenas. Yes, he manipulates Mufasa and Simba, but I don't really count them and we don't see him interact with any of the lionesses until Mufasa's death. That made me conclude that I needed to add a new character and immediately this one character came to mind who was the antagonist in the second Lion King movie and made me realize what an enormous missed opportunity it was not to have this character in the remake. I'm talking about the one and only Zira. Quick recap and spoiler for the second film. Just like Lion King was a retelling of Hamlet, Lion King 2 was a retelling of a story as old as time, Romeo and Juliet. Romeo being Kovu, the son of Zira, and Juliet portrayed as Kiara, who is Simba's daughter. I think you can guess the rest from there. Zira is a lion that was banished from the Pride Lands for being a supporter of Scar, I suppose. It never really tells why she was banished or why there are so many other lionesses with her. With this new rewrite, I hope to explain some of this, and with Zira now added, everything was pretty much falling into place after that. The script in my head was coming together far faster than I could type, but I finished it. Keep in mind, I'm not changing the entire movie word for word. That would take me months. Instead, I'm going to insert new scenes, edit already existing ones to complement the changes I'm making. I'm going to narrate the script changes and my own add-ins that will be accompanied by pictures that I've drawn. I drew these pictures for the new scenes that I'm adding and to give you a window as to what it is I'm envisioning when doing this rewrite. I also did this because I wanted to avoid using as much Lion King visuals as I can to keep from being copyrighted. Let me make this clear. I'm no professional artist, voice actor, writer, or film editor. I'm doing this because I want to share my ideas with you and possibly hear your opinions if they're not mean. 
I will start each scene with a script read and explain why I changed what I did and why I drew the pictures the way that I did. Please keep in mind that these pictures are not drawn to the best of my abilities. I drew them quickly and repaced a lot of the backgrounds and lines because I did not want to spend too much time on pictures that were only going to be seen for seconds at a time. And with that, let's get started. For the first 13 minutes of the movie, I'm not going to change anything because more or less that's as good as we're going to get without digitally correcting it. Only after Mufasa gives his speech to Simba on top of Pride Rock and they walk down and into the grasslands would the camera return to the bottom of Pride Rock and show Zira looking out into the Pride Lands. Don't you think it's a bit early to be scouting for the evening hunt, Zira? Of course, if I always came in second to Sarafina, I'd do the same. What's it to you? Nothing, but a little birdie did tell me that a herd of hyenas was grazing on the west side of the Pride Lands today. And who would this bird be? Not Zazu. You have all morning to check it out, and if I'm wrong, you get a pleasant hike out of it. And if you're right, the Pride will thank you for full bellies. I suppose there's no harm in checking. Okay, not only did I want to change the script, but also I thought it would be more beneficial if Scar only had one eye because he's a two-faced character, and I thought that would be great to use camera-wise when he interacts with other characters. Right here, I drew his picture only showing his right side, his right good eye to symbolize the front he's putting on, the somewhat obedient and more or less content line. What's more significant about this add-in is that I tried to give the line's pride more dimension because in both movies, we're made to believe that everything's perfect under Mufasa's rule, but it's more about balance. Now, for those of you who don't remember, Sarafina is Nala's mother, and other than that one line we get from her, we don't hear from her again and get no information on her whatsoever. Scar's first line informs you that Sarafina is a prominent hunter and Zira is constantly losing to her, which entices her to get up earlier to scout for the pride's next move meal and you will learn the importance of that later. Now the mention of the zebras and the location will be important in the next couple of scenes. Also something else you may have noticed is that Zira and Scar are not friends or allies in any way but the manipulation has already begun. I didn't do any pictures for this scene because it's only three lines. When Zazu reports that the hyenas are in the Pride Lands, I want him to announce where they are, meaning the west side. And when Mufasa asks where Sarabi is, I want Zazu to answer she's with the hunting party where they were alerted by Zira. With this slight change, you start putting the pieces together of Scar's manipulation. And another important note is Zira's recognition, not only to Sarabi, but also to Mufasa. That will be important, I promise. Another slight change that I wanted to do that I did not draw pictures for was the bath scene. When Simba returns to Pride Rock and finds the other lionesses, it bothered me that Sarabi was already there. In the remake, she was leading the charge, so she should not have gotten back before Simba did. I know he was talking to Scar, but still, that's my personal opinion. Also, what I thought would have been cute was after Serafina said she's having her bath, if Sarabi did come back and said to Simba, and it's time for yours, surprising him and catching him off guard. I had no real issues with the elephant graveyard scene or the father and son moment with Mufasa and Simba. Now we get to one of the seriously messed up scenes in the remake. Scar's confrontation with the hyenas, or what it was more famously known as before the remake, the be prepared scene. I'm starting to believe that the carcasses I leave for you on the edge of the Pride Lands has made your clan soft. Is there one out there now? As if you deserve it. You said they would be alone. And whose fault is that? You expect us to do everything? I expect results. That's why I feed you. I'll let this one go, but I won't be so forgiving the next time. What makes you think there'll be a next time? It's a wonderful feeling, having a full belly. When was the last time you, any of you, have experienced such gluttonous? As I thought. After all, a hyena's belly is never full. If you want to someday feast upon all that the light touches, for the rest of your lives, you'll pay attention. Killing one little cub is going to do all that for us. No, but killing Mufasa will. Okay, how do I start this? I had no issues with Shinzi being the leader of the hyenas. In fact, I liked the idea. That's how hyenas operate in the wild. They have the female leader. What I didn't appreciate was that this appeared to have been the first time that Scar actually interacted with the hyenas. And the first thing he does when he's in their territory and surrounded, 
He insults them. He calls them fools, and because Shinzi is the leader, he ultimately is saying she's the fool. In the original, it's clear that Scar has a previous relationship with the hyenas, and even though it's obvious he's annoyed by them and very much looks down on them, and even when they fail him, he still feeds them because he needs to keep them dependent on him. This is very similar to Light and Misa's relationship in Death Note. Light does not like Misa at all and would have immediately killed her for her Death Note if not for Rem. But even after Rem was gone, the only reason he kept Misa Misa around was for her Shimigami eyes and blind devotion on doing whatever he said. And all he had to give in return was his affection which he only gave when he needed her to do something or when she did her part with no significant screw ups. In my script rewrite, I reestablished their previous relationship and if you've been paying attention so far, not only is Scar's left eye very prominent in this scene, but I think you would have noticed the connecting of the dots in their conversation. Simba and Nala were supposed to be alone but Mufasa showed up, but Scar blames them for that because the hyenas in the west side of the Pride Lands earlier that morning were supposed to keep him busy, hence Shinzi saying, you expect us to do everything. Now I know I might get in trouble for saying this, but I did not mind the altered Be Prepared song. It felt like it fit better with the tone of the remake. I just wish that they would have kept going in that direction instead of half-assing it and, and pasting the second half with Be Prepared. After the end of the song, instead of going straight to the gorge, I wanted to be more morning, showing Scar looking out to the Pride Lands, looking out at what will be his at the end of the second act. Well, it's been decided that the hunt will be cancelled since the herd is so close to the gorge. Instead, we'll be hunting in the grasslands. And Mufasa? Sarabi said he'll be patrolling the east side, near the gorge. Why do you want to know all this? I thought I'd take a walk, and I'd hate to intrude on your first hunt as lead of the hunting party. Now, in Scar and Zira's first conversation, he suggests scouting the west side where the hyenas was and she sounded the alarm. Scar's last line informs you that she was rewarded. In their first scene, I tried to make it apparent with my poor voice acting that they were not friends or allies and that she wasn't really wanting to cooperate with him. But here, not only is it apparent that they've talked more off screen, but Zira is more willing to assist him as a way of saying thank you. But I want to make it clear that she does not know what's going on. But by the end of the scene, she is a little suspicious of his motives. One more thing I want to point out is Zira's picture. In their first interaction when she turned to talk to him, half her face was shadowed. I did it to hint at her unknowingly dark descent. Once she starts interacting with Scar, and it only gets worse as you see her entire body is shadowed except her face, and if I had directed this, I would want the shadow to consume the rest of her as Scar walks away. This next scene everyone had issues with, and that was how Mufasa died. First off, I did not like how this line was said. Help me! It sounded to me like Mufasa was demanding Scar to help him when in the original you could clearly hear the plead for help. Brother! Help me! In my version, I extended the scene. Instead of it being, long live the king, and then he swipes him, I switched that line with, an eye for an eye, brother. But when he swipes him, Mufasa grabs hold of him, pulling him over, but only his lower half, as seen in the picture. Once Scar knows he's not going over, he looks down at Mufasa once again and says the words. Long live the king! Scar pushes his weight onto Mufasa, causing him to lose his grip and fall to his death. I don't know how realistic this would have been, but I know this would have made for better suspense. The scene would have ended with Scar pulling himself up to safety, and once it was clear that Mufasa was not coming back up, a smile would have slowly crept up on his face as his long annoyed obstacle was finally out of his way, and now it was Simba's turn. Oh, what will your mother think? She'll hate me. No, she won't. She'll try to protect you from the other lionesses. Someone has to be held responsible. You're too young. Your mother will take the blame, and they'll cast her out for it. What will become of her? No, they can't do that. What do I do? There has to be something I can do. Scar, please help me. Ron, if you leave, the blame goes with you. It's the only way to save your mother. But Simba, if you go, you can never return. 
Now, I know I'm probably going to get a lot of hate for this, but the voice acting for this supposedly gut-wrenching scene was so bad, in my opinion, that it made me believe that they picked the wrong voice actor for young Simba. He's a great singer, but he's not a voice actor yet. I'm no better. In fact, I'm worse, but I have no experience. I have no voice coach. JD did, but I'm not blaming him. I'm blaming the studio whose job it was to prepare him for the role. As much as I love the original movie and this scene right Right here, something never set right with me on the reasoning for Simba leaving and it definitely didn't make sense in the remake. When I hear the line, what would your mother think, that's when I knew I had to make it about her. Make her the reason he leaves. The whole point of this scene in the original remake and rewrite is to torture Simba emotionally before Scar kills him. And truthfully, I wish I could have directed this because when Simba asked Scar for help, I really wanted to show Scar struggling to keep his smile in. Much like Light struggled to retain his laughter when he truly believed he had won at El's grave and facing near, those small little quirks is what really makes these kinds of characters so entertaining to watch that you can't look away. When Scar returns and tells in his words what happened, the camera cuts to Zira as she puts the pieces together and, and deciphers Scar's deception. When the hyenas start to come in, making it clear that they're outnumbered, Zira makes her choice. She bows to her king and those who followed her in the hunt follow her lead and submit. This scene is pretty much self-explanatory. When Zira realizes her involvement, she contemplates on what good it would do to call Scar out when it would only out her too, especially when Scar has an army. In this next scene, I did like that they added this basically showing the lionesses more, but they did a poor job executing it like they did everything else in the movie. We have to do something. We need to fight. Nala, we're not all as young as you. Then let's leave before it's too late. It's not that simple, Nala. Now with so many eyes watching, not to mention... Too many have taken to Scar's leadership. Our numbers are not what they used to be. How can they do that? Scar is the king, but you are our queen. You are young and impatient. Our time will come, Nala. Be patient. Sarabi. The king wishes to see you. When watching the remake, it was obvious that this scene was mainly added to show Nala off as a strong, independent female character and show why she left. But really, what the hell did this scene actually do for the story or characters? In the original movie, near the end, Sarabi is summoned by Scar and the way she presents herself and the way she maintains herself, that is a strong female character. And because of this scene in the remake, it takes away Sarabi's defining moment in the original movie. Here, all she's doing is making making excuses and not very good ones since she contradicts herself in the next scene. But before we get to that, in the rewrite, I want to give better answers as to why they did not fight back or run. And had Sarabi been correctly written, her reasoning would have been in consideration of her pride. Nala is in her prime, but what of the other lionesses, especially if they've been there for generations? If only this scene could have shown Zira with her hunting party returning and showing just how Scar's reign has divided the pride because in the original and remake they pretty much stayed unified but was just too afraid to do anything. I'm going to go ahead and show the next scene real quick with Scar and Sarabi talking. Won't you join me, Sarabi? There's plenty to go around. You're overhunting, Scar. I've simply perfected the kill with the help of my army. You're killing everything. Most of the lionesses have fallen in line. Why can't you? Stop resisting and allow the other lionesses to accept me, and then we can become the cohesive pride I have always envisioned us being. I will never be your queen. I did not like this. In my eyes, Sarabi was contradicting herself. Her excuse for not fighting back is because Scar is king, but in this scene, Scar accuses her of resisting his ruling. The scene ends with, I will never be your queen, which is fighting back. I know that what Nala meant was physical force, but still, pushing back in any form is fighting back. When Sarabi makes her way to Scar, I wanted her to stop and look at Zira, who appeared to be ashamed. 
I drew this to hint at a relationship which will be seen in the next altered scene. It starts in the dead of night where Nala has decided to leave. Instead of Scar nearly discovering her, it's Zira, but this scene serves two purposes. Zira. It's awful late, my queen. A lioness of your age should be getting as much rest as she can. <laughs> Is something funny? I didn't know you still saw me as your queen. How can you ask? Then why do you follow him? You never asked such questions when Mufasa was king. Perhaps I should have. You had such promise, and yet you only ever seemed to see Sarafina. I saw you too, Zira. I see you. I see all of you, and it pains me to see our once united pride splintered. Come back to us, Zira. Let us be united once more. Scar is our king, and without a king, we are lost. I fear we are already lost. Okay, this interaction allowed Nala to escape and shows that while Zira follows Scar, she still very much sees Sarabi as her queen and reveals that she looked up to Sarabi. At the same time, it shows Sarabi being a teacher, a leader, a queen. Sarabi admits her mistakes for not interacting with the other lionesses more, even though they weren't the best. That is what that line, perhaps I should have, was addressing. But she also reveals that even though she did not interact with them as much, she still kept her eye on them and and their potential, as a teacher does. They observe in order to better instruct those struggling and those on the verge of peaking. I wanted to make this a moment where Zira had an option to redeem herself, but chose not to out of fear, which is embodied in the presence of Shinzi. Whether or not this is a necessary add-in is up to you to decide, but for me, I thought it was very important for these two characters. The next scene, as you all may guess, is when Nala and Simba are reunited. God, did this remake annoy the hell out of me. I can't believe it. You're really here, aren't you? I can't believe you're here too. Wait till you see this place, Nala. It's beautiful. That's not what I meant. You look so much like him. Simba, you're the king. King? <laughs> Lady, have you got your lion's crawl? Could you guys excuse us for a few minutes? Mm, maybe you better go. It starts. You think you know a guy. <sighs> Timon and Pumbaa. You'll learn to love him. It's like you're back from the dead. You have no idea what that means. What it means to me. Nala, let me show you this place. Show you its beauty. This scene broke my patience and made me want to turn the movie off. It was not good. The whole point of this meet and greet was to remind Simba of his heritage and invoke a desire to return home. The original did this extremely well by carefully navigating the conversation. Once the two calm down from their unexpected reunion and really start to talk, it's Nala that brings up the pride which makes her think of Sarabi and how they all thought he was dead which makes her think of the gorge where he supposedly died at. That Scar, the current king, told her and ultimately reminds her that Simba is the king. The conversation from point A to point B was very carefully crafted, but with the remake we got this. This place is amazing. It's everything you could ever want. Simba, we need to leave. Scar has taken over with the hyenas. You have to take your place as king. Without it taking any significant time for her to process seeing her childhood friend who she believed to be dead all this time, she tells him that they need to leave and he needs to be king. And she keeps pressuring him, but with no real argument from him. He just runs off and she runs after him laughing. Seriously, I know my rewrite might not be any better, but I want to save a lot of it for when they have their argument. The only real significant change that I made was instead of Scar reminding Nala of Simba's heritage, it's Mufasa. In both the original and remake, everyone mistakes Simba at first to be Mufasa, and I thought, why not Nala too? There's something I don't understand. If you've been alive all this time, why haven't you come home? We've really needed you. They're fine, all right? Nobody needs me. What about your mother? She's at Pride Rock with the other lionesses, isn't she? So she's fine. Simba, the Pride Lands are decimated. There's no food, water. Scarlet the hyenas in. That doesn't matter. Akuna Matata. What? It means no worries. Bad things happen and it can't be helped. So why worry? Because everyone is starving to death, including your mother. I can't... I can't go back. Why? Does it have to do with what happened at the gorge? 
You know? It was an accident, but that doesn't give you an excuse to neglect your responsibilities. You sound just like my father. Good, at least one of us does. You have no idea. No idea! You show up after so many years and think you can tell me how to live my life? You have no idea what I've been through. Tell me! Talk to me! What are you holding back? When doing the rewrite, I had to carefully incorporate Sarabi in it since she was the reason Simba left and stayed away. That's why I had Nala constantly bring her up because even if he wasn't willing to return for her, he might do it for the sake of his mother. But for Simba, it only reinforced the fear that if he was to return home and what he believed to be the truth is revealed, the other lionesses may very well shun Sarabi and given the state that the Pride Lands are in, it would only decrease her chances of surviving. In the remake, I had no real issues with the first half of the conversation, but the second half just made Nala less sympathetic. I mean, my god, when Simba said, you have no idea what I've been through, instead of encouraging him to open up to her, she instead abruptly says, I came here looking for help. I guess I made a mistake. Goodbye, Simba. How does this even make sense for a conversation? It's almost as if the writers gave up or believed this scene wasn't important enough to construct a mildly decent conversation. My other theory is, because Beyonce was voicing Nala, they wanted to make Nala her own main character instead of being the well-written supporting character that she was. The scene even ends with Nala leaving to return back home. When Simba does have his moment of self-reflection and decide to face his past, that moment of self-acceptance is quickly diminished when it shows him catching up to Nala. Nala. I know it sounds like I'm hating on Nala and Beyonce, but I'm not. I'm hating on the way they rewrote her character. How I think this half should have ended is with Nala seeing Simba running and joins him. Then Timon and Pumbaa follows and just ends the shot with all four of them. Where's the kill, Zira? We have scouted every inch of the Pride Lands. The herds are all gone. You're just not looking hard enough. Perhaps I put the wrong line in charge of the hunt. Scar, there is nothing left. Don't you talk back to your king. Leave her alone, Scar. It's time to come to a realization. We need to leave Pride Rock. We're not going anywhere. Then you have sentenced our deaths, including your own. So be it. You can't do that. I am the king. My word is law. You are nothing compared to Mufasa. This was probably one of the most important rewrites because this is where everything I've added and changed comes to full circle. But this is only the first part. But first, I want to talk about the original. After Scar ascends to power, it cuts back to him after Simba grew up and shows how bad things are getting, but it doesn't show him concerned about it, which indicates that he is in denial. And after Simba returns and Scar summons Sarabi, you can clearly see him frustrated. And as the conversation continues, he becomes more and more agitated as Sarabi points out everything that's wrong. It finally boils over when she concludes that they need to leave, which Scar won't have because leaving would be admitting his failure as a king. The remake completely ignores all this and just has him frustrated that Sarabi won't be his queen, which is stupid when there's more pressing matters to deal with like not starving to death. In the rewrite, it's Zira that's reporting all this to him and when he loses his temper, it's Sarabi that steps forward as the queen that she is to protect all members of her pride. I'm not a murderer. We should believe a son who takes the life of a father. We should believe a son who takes the life of a king. A son who abandons his mother. No, I'm, I'm. You're what? Say it. Are you the king? No, no, I'm. Are you the king? No, I'm. You're what? I'm. Say it. I'm nothing. Then bow to your king. <laughs> Simba. How amusing, like father, like son. You always wanted to be just like him, didn't you? Even down to how he died, apparently. That truly was the most joyous day of my life, watching him die, watching him put the pieces together right before he fell to his death. I actually liked how they did this part and even showing Scar's confidence by having him lay down. This reminded me of Light and how, after confessing to being Kira, he still maintained a level of control and confidence. What I did not like was how Scar admitted to his crime. It was a bit too dimensional for this remake and honestly, as loud as he was talking, I don't know how they needed confirmation to confirm his lie. When I rewrote this, I wanted it not to be so obvious but kind of use what they already know about Scar and how he felt about Mufasa and make Simba 
Papa put the pieces together himself along with the others. Zera, what pieces is he talking about? Zera, defend your king. Zera, please tell us. I thought nothing of it at the time. That day, he asked for our hunting schedule and of Mufasa's location. I'm sorry. Traitor! So you admit it. I killed Mufasa. We're entering the home stretch now. When reaching the end of Zera's part in the story, I knew it wasn't going to be a black and white conclusion, but instead put her in a state of purgatory. Similar to Zuko from Avatar The Last Airbender, when Azula enters the story and Zuko becomes a fugitive, he becomes uncertain of his path which puts him in a purgatory state and this becomes very apparent in the Ba Sing Se arc, especially after he frees Appa. When Zera gives the rest of the pride to pieces which announces her involvement, she runs off. Some of the other lionesses that follow her runs too, unsure that they will be spared whoever the victor may be. Also, I know you must be wondering, why lights laugh? Why not? Scar attacking Zera would have initiated the final battle, but it would have come off as an vengeance for Zera than Mufasa. The scene would have been focused on Zera, and with her part done, the story needed to be redirected to avenging Mufasa, and since my mind was already on Death Note, I thought, why not? And in my opinion, it does seem to work. It's over, Scar. Have mercy, I beg you. Mercy? To what you did? It was a hyena, Simba. Those revolting scavengers cornered me, threatened my life, threatened you. Mufasa couldn't keep them out of the Pride Lands. It would have only been a matter of time. I did it to protect you. I fell for your lies once, but never again. You won't kill me. That's not who you are. That's not the king Mufasa wanted you to be. Don't say his name. Tell me what to do, Simba. Tell me how I can redeem myself. Run and take the blame with you. Again, some parts are too flat to carry any believable weight in the remake with this kind of realism. That included Scar and Simba's final confrontation. Instead of just throwing the hyenas under the bus and letting that be the end of it, if this was going to be Scar's final act of manipulation, similar to Light, let him use everything and everyone he can as a last power play before losing it all. Alright, that's a wrap. Seriously, I am so happy that it's finally over. So many things went wrong making this video. Thank God it's over. Apologies for the audio and for my voice. This was my first time ever making a video like this. There were so many retakes and season allergies are a bitch. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and sticking around till the end. Please comment and let me know what you think. Was my version better or worse? Did you enjoy it? Would you like to see more videos like this? Let me know and happy holidays everyone.